Hi right, guys, today we're going to take a look and see how we study history and the idea of prehistory. We'll talk about prehistory a little more in class. The biggest difference here is that history is what we see that is written down. Prehistory, things that are not written down. And we'll see how we study these things here in class. First, we're going to start out with this is the calendar. Just how old everything actually is. Now, big question is, is there just one calendar or is there more than one calendar? In fact, we'll see there are a lot of different calendars in the world. Um, obviously, everyone remembers the big Mayan calendar scare of 2012, uh, you know, which everyone thought the world was going to end, that kind of stuff, because that was one calendar. The Romans had their own calendar created by Julius Caesar. Uh, if you're Jewish, there's a Jewish calendar, there's, a, there's an Islamic calendar. All these different cultures have a calendar. Now, the one we use is called the Gregorian calendar. Uh, it was created by Pope Gregory the 13th, and essentially he took the Roman calendar, called the Julian calendar after Julius Caesar, and he changed it a little bit to put all of the important church days in there. Then he enforced the church used in Europe to use this calendar. Britain started using it in the 1500s, and so that came here to us as well. Uh, there are a few countries in the world that are just now adopting the Gregorian calendar. I believe Russia started it, gosh, not too long ago. Uh, it was within the last 20 years that Russia switched to the Gregorian calendar. So the question here is, which of these four dates is older? I have 100 CE, 200 BC, 200 AD, 100 BC. We'll see in a second, okay? Which one of these is actually older? Um, the growing calendar makes year zero kind of a middle point. It's like in math where you're doing positive negative numbers. You have zero in the middle, and you kind of uh, base your numbers off of that zero. Now, is year zero really year zero? Probably not. We're probably off by seven or eight years in there somewhere because of record keeping and all that kind of stuff that was in there. But beyond that point... Uh, anything that is before year zero was called B.C., that then time called before Christ because it was before year zero. Of course, Jesus Christ being used since it was a Christian calendar. Um, other people call this B.C.E., uh, called before common era because obviously not everyone that uses calendar in the world is a Christian, so some people got a little offended by B.C., all that kind of stuff. So B.C.E., kind of the more politically correct way to explain things. Anything that was after year zero, they called A.D., A.D. stood for Anno Domini. That meant year of Christ. So I think after year zero had A.D. put after it. Uh, we also use C.E. for that common era. Same thing as A.D., just being after year zero. So the question is, which one of these is actually older? Well, looking at the, we have year zero right in the, in the middle here is year zero, okay? And look at our dates, we would know that 200 B.C. was going to be your oldest because it's the furthest away from zero. Then 100 B.C.E. or B.C. because we're getting closer to zero here. Then we hit year zero, then after it would be 100, and then 200 climbing up after year zero. We'll do activity with this in class just to make sure we got the concept down, guys, right? So that's how the calendar works. Here's a bigger question. How do we date artifacts that do not have a date on them? Not everything has a born-on date or a calendar date on it, so how do we figure out how old some stuff really actually is? Well, first one, we use something called relative dating. And no, this is not asking your cousin homecoming, all right? Uh, this is all based around when you find an artifact or something, it's based around the stuff around it, okay? It's kind of like relative location we talked about earlier between absolute location. So we can, if so we find a piece of uh, a pottery in the dirt, okay? We then, we then look at the stuff around it. If we know the stuff around it is from 1000 BCE, that piece of pottery must be pretty close to 1000 BCE. We then look at the stuff buried below our piece of pottery, and we were pretty sure that that, that stuff below it is, you know, older than, than 1,000. The stuff above it in the dirt is older, is uh, younger than 1,000. Is it a really accurate system? No. It's a very general way of organizing how old something really is. But it does work. If we get more exact, we use radiocarbon dating, okay? We'll do a little video on this, but radiocarbon dating uh, is based off of measuring how much carbon-12 is left in some, in, in some organic material. Now, organic means at one point it was living. You, me, dogs, cats, plants, aardvarks, all those kind of things are all organic beings. We have carbon in us. And after we die, we're gone, okay? After we're gone, that carbon starts breaking down. We can actually measure this radio, this uh, the isotope called carbon-12 to figure out how long it takes to decay. It's pretty accurate, but it's not accurate uh, much past about 10,000 years or so. So it kind of makes things a little different there, okay? Um, and really only accurate to about 50,000 years in the end. Now, the other one we use is something called thermoluminescence. Uh, that is where we look at a uh, something, electrons that are trapped in the soil around artifact, and we measure how much light they give off. By far our most accurate thing here, around 200,000 years, 
and we'll look at another little video about carbon dating in a second in, in class. But um, our thermal luminescence is by far our most accurate dating. Now, looking at how old stuff is is one thing. The bigger question is this: How do we become what we are today? Think about who we are physically, mentally, socially. Why people are the way they are today? We're gonna start the story way back a long, long time ago. Now, obviously, there are two theories as to how people came to be. You have the creationist theory, and you have evolutionary theory. Now, one thing I'm not saying is I'm not saying either one of these is fact. All right, neither one of these is a proven fact. Now, some people will say they are, but neither one really is. They're both still theories. Uh, in terms of creationism, there are thousands of theories that are out there. Okay, at least one for every single religion. I've seen. Everything from the Christian story to the Islamic theory uh, story to uh, Hindu stories, um, different Native American religious stories, all those kind of things. Okay, they all happen in difficult ways. Different ways, some are more mystical than the others. My, one of my favorite ones is the, you know the Greek story of the, of the Titans and all this kind of stuff that happens with that. Um, and honestly, you can't take any of these theories of creation and disprove any of them. They're all based upon what you believe, uh, what what you think. Now, in terms of evolutionary theory, there's a guy named Charles Darwin that inspired this. Uh, Charles Darwin, Darwin was a, uh, a scientist uh, in the 1800s, a British, uh, British scientist, British thinker, and he wrote a book called Origin of Species. Uh, he had spent time on a ship called the HMS Beagle. He went to the Galapagos Islands where he studied finches. Yeah, that's where I talked about some biology last year. Um, and he got the idea of survival of the fittest, that you know certain finches survive because their beaks were the right way to eat the certain kinds of foods. Well, people took this and adapted it to people as well. Essentially, those that do not adapt will go extinct. It's the idea of natural selection. Either you change or you're gone. That's pretty much what it comes down to. And we do have fossil evidence that can link us to creatures that are 10, you know, 10 20, 30 millions of years old in theory. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of missing links uh, that we really don't have. You know, we don't have a to do, to do, to do, to do, to do. Uh, kind of way to put to put together that we shouldn't go from step to step to step. There are a lot of holes in this whole story, and the idea is really up for debate. A lot of the research happens over here in uh, what's called the Great Rift Valley. It's right here, a big gorge uh, in Africa where the two continents are pulling apart. And because the continents are pulling apart, a lot of these fossils are coming up to the surface. They found a lot of ape man fossils, a lot of, things, a lot of fossils that have uh, common characteristics between people, human, modern day humans, and uh, apes. And so this is where we get a theory called the out of Africa theory, that originally all people, our origins are in Africa, where, you know, uh, the first, you know, early humans started here and then migrated out to Europe and Middle East and Asia and so on and so forth. And so that's why, it's, why the research, a lot of research takes place there. So the question is, what have we found? Um, one of the biggest focus is looking at is finding when did early humans walk? Okay, they look at bone structure, back structure, hip structure, um, leg structure, figure out when people walked upright. They figured out when they used tools. You know, looking at hand structure, looking at tools that are around them. The other thing to look at is on pe is people's brains. You know, how big was a human's brain? We'll look at animation in class to look at this. But that's kind of things they look at. Um, we'll talk about why they look at these things in class a little bit. Now, one of the things we have was the word hominid. You guys got to know this word hominid. Hominid just means early human. And they're all different kinds of early humans, and they're all related in some way, shape, or form. And so one of the first ones that people have in this list is something called Australopithecus. Australopithecus was, uh, is in Latin, southern ape. Uh, lived anywhere from 7 to 1 million years ago, and essentially evolved from an ancient chimpanzee. Um, it, it's thought that, that this little Australopithecus uh, you know, walked upright, was a biped, and that by being a biped, it had a better chance of survival because it could see above the tall grass, it could see predators, and then run away. Looking at the brain size, looking at uh, the brain size is about a third of the size of a human brain. Now, we actually did find a very complete Australopithecus skeleton. It's called Lucy. It was found by uh, Dr. Donald Leakey in 1974. And so here we have uh, this body of Lucy here. And looking at the hip structure and the bone structure, they found that, uh, you know, she walked upright and that then her hands refused to do other things. She also see better, those kind of things. It's that whole idea of survival of the fittest, that she was able to, be able to survive because she had those traits, and that other animals might die out because they didn't. From there, we have what's called Homo habilis, um, which is the handy human. The idea that certain Australopithecus uh, later evolved, or the traits continued to change, and we have the idea of walking upright. Uh, they're a lot larger than Australopithecus, lived about 1.5, 2.5 million years ago, 
I think they were special because their hands are freer, are freer to use tools. And so it's a big part of it there. There's a homo erectus called upright man where we actually found tools around these skeletons. Um, the famous hand axe was one of these. It was basically a flaked off piece of rock used to chop, cut, scrape, all those kind of things. Um, we also this the first group that uh, started to control fire. We found Australopithecus oscil skeletons in caves that had been around uh, ancient fires, and we can actually tell that they used some form of fire. Uh, and so we also found the tools here. Some examples of the tools they use made from volcanic rock. Uh, volcanic rock flakes very, very easily. You can make a nice sharp edge of it, and that way they could cut, scrape, and dig with these tools. You can see some of the examples of the skeletons here. We'll talk more about these in class. Uh, later on, we have what's called Homo sapiens. Now, Homo sapiens are us. Okay, we're we're considered Homo sapiens, but there are all kinds of different Homo sapiens out there as well. And one group we call the Neanderthals, or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Uh, they were found in Germany and by Neanderthal, and uh, essentially they're like humans, but had a little different facial feature. They had bigger brains, bigger heads, just big brow ridge, kind of looks like this in this artist reconstruction here. And they were really short, really wide, and honestly, probably a lot stronger than modern-day humans were. We're not really sure why they died out, but, you know, it could be the, uh, an environmental thing, could be a disease thing, all these things could have played a role. Here's an example of the brain size that the Neanderthal brain was probably a lot bigger than our brain actually was. We also have the Homo sapiens sapiens, which is essentially us, wise human, our direct ancestors. Sometimes they're called Cro-Magnon. Uh, they appeared around, you know, our earliest examples are 160,000 years ago and spread all over the world. And I'm looking at some examples of these Homo sapiens, from the tools they made, the art they created, all those kind of things we're going to look at in, in class here about what these early, early humans were, uh, how they control fire, all those kind of things. Now uh, here's some examples of tools we got, scrapes, points, needles, all those kind of things. Um, we're going to stop here with the idea of Paleolithic. We're going to pick up this uh, next time around. Make sure your notes are done for this Wednesday. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you later.